basically, the main purpose of this introduction is to make me blush. But um, <laughs> a real pleasure to be here. I uh, um, I, I sample I cast but low frequency, so I you know I come every every once in a while, every few years. Uh, the first uh, time I came to I cast was actually it was uh, I think just about 20 years ago in Munich in 1987. Um, and uh, no, that's what the, that was not the first time. That was the first time I had a paper at ICAST, I should say. Uh, the first, my first one was in 1988. You know, that goes back a very long time. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the power, power and limits of uh, deep learning uh, for signal understanding, whatever signal you're interested in. And of course, I'm going to start with what is used in 95% of applications of MLS and NT5. I just you know, putting this out of thin air, it might be 99 or 94, it's supervised learning. So we, we all have some intuitive idea of what supervised learning is. It's you, you have a parameterized function, a machine, a learning machine, which is really a parameterized function. Since this is uh, signal processing, I, I use here uh, an analog synthesizer to symbolize this. Um, and the way you train it is that you show it pictures of various categories, and whenever the machine uh, produces the wrong answer, you tell it you have the wrong answer, and you adjust the parameters so that next time around, uh, the answer gets closer to what you want. And of course, there are many, many people here in this room who know what an adaptive filter is, and it's nothing more than an adaptive filter, except it's, uh, it's nonlinear. It's uh, uh, nothing more than that. So, um, we can use this, what's surprising is that is, is how well it works despite, despite the simple uh, concept, uh, uh, the simplicity of the concept. So with this we can match uh, speech to words, of course speech recognition is, you know, uh, I cast territory, uh, images to categories, portraits to names, uh, for face recognition, uh, photos to captions, text to topics, etc. We can translate uh, languages as well. And what's happened over the last few years with the emergence of deep learning is that the, the traditional model of pattern recognition was you take your raw signal, you pre-process it in an appropriate way, and uh, a lot of techniques for pre-processing signals come from this community, and you turn it into a bunch of more or less independent variables that represent what you care about and kind of eliminates what you don't care about. And then you plug a classifier on top of this that will actually do the classification if that's what you're interested in, or regression if you want to predict. And essentially, deep learning has replaced this by this idea that you can uh, build a system as a cascade, or more generally as a graph of uh, operators. All of those uh, operators are parameterized, and they're all more or less differentiable in such a way that you can compute a gradient of some objective function with respect to all the parameters in the system, and then learn, uh, of course, all the parameters. And and there can be a lot of non-linearities in the system and it still works. And that's what really, I think, is surprising, is the power of gradient descent. That gradient descent actually works if you have uh, very large uh, systems with many, many parameters, uh, perhaps, uh, in, in, you know, initially in neural nets, uh, the number of parameters in typical neural nets were in the hundreds or, or in the thousands. Nowadays, Neural nets are used in practice for everyday applications have ten, tens of millions or hundreds of, hundreds of millions of parameters. And so that's kind of the surprising thing, if you want, that this whole thing works. And there was a big a disbelief uh, from the quantum machine learning community for many years that this could possibly work, despite considerable empirical evidence that it does work. Um, so multilayer neural nets are a particular instantiation of this thing, and uh, really they, they are kind of where the root of it, of, of all of this goes. But but really, uh, kind of modern deep learning systems go, go way beyond uh, traditional neural nets. But essentially, if you alternate linear operations with nonlinear operations, so linear operation is basically multiplying a vector by a matrix, or performing a convolution or something like that. And then uh, you apply a pointwise nonlinearity. In modern neural nets, this pointwise nonlinearity is very simple. It's just a half ray rectification, uh, also called a ReLU, rectified linear unit. And then you repeat the operations, linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear. You basically get a universal approximator. And by changing the coefficients in the, in the matrices, you can basically approximate any function you want. And the surprising thing is that, uh, at least for some people, is that uh, uh, the more layers you add, the kind of better it works if you if you do this carefully. 
So of course, learning is basically a minimization of an objective function, which would be an average over 20 samples of some discrepancy between the output you want and the output you get, and you compute the gradient of this uh, uh, objective function with respect to all the parameters in the system using uh, um, you know, what used to be called backpropagation. Now it's obtained using, uh, I mean, still backpropagation, but it's basically automatically derived. You write a program that computes the output of the network and then compute the objective function, and automatically another function is generated to compute the gradient of this objective with respect to all the parameters in the system. In fact, it's become so general in that that people start talking about differentiable computation or differentiable programming. You don't write a program anymore, you write a program by SMB, SMB modules and, uh, and you can train the parameters of those modules to do what you want. Uh, so people generally use some form of stochastic gradient with some tricks, which I'm not going to go into. And the, the cool thing about backpropagation, which is nothing more than a practical application of a chain rule, so the level of math there is really not that complicated. Um, uh, the, the beauty of it is, uh, is that computing the gradient takes just about as much uh, computation as computing the output of the system to start with, so it's very cheap. Um, and it's called back computation because the gradients basically flow backwards in the graph of computation that is used to compute the output of the system. Okay, so now we can start about uh, thinking about how do we specialize those uh, systems in such a way that they process certain certain types of signals appropriately. And of course, uh, a particularly uh, popular approach these days for a lot of different applications is convolutional networks, something I started working on when I was still a postdoc uh, at University of Toronto with Jeff Hinton in 1988, and kind of developed really when I joined Bell Labs in late 1988 um, for the purpose of handwriting recognition and later for, later for other applications. And what convolutional nets uh, are, so the nice thing about this community is that I don't have to explain what a convolution is. Um, you know, my background, my undergraduate degree is in electrical engineering. When I talk to computer scientists, you know, I kind of have to explain what convolution really means. But, you know, here, uh, essentially, uh, this is a network where the linear operations are, instead of being full matrices, are uh, discrete convolutions or multiple discrete convolutions. So here you, you see uh, an example of an old vintage convolutional net, uh, where um, the convolution kernel is about five, and you kind of swipe it over the image, it gives you a feature map, and you have, in this case, four different convolution kernels that use four different feature maps that constitute the first layer. And the second uh, operation that we perform here is uh, what's commonly referred to as pooling, you know, pooling and subsampling, and it consists in basically aggregating the output of the filters over a small area, in this case two by two, and in some form, so it can be either uh, a max or an average or uh, L2 norm or LP norm of any kind or some sort of function that is uh, invariant to permutation of the arguments. And the purpose of this is to build a little bit of shift and transition invariance into the representation of the system and eliminate the details, if you want, of, uh, of, of the, the representation. And then you stack multiple stages of this. So you repeat, you have convolutions, now the convolutions, instead of being applied to a single image, they apply to multiple feature maps with different kernels, and you add the results, um, apply nonlinearity, then pool again, and then repeat the process multiple times, in this case just, uh, just two times. And the origin of this is really neuroscience. Uh, the inspiration for this is a uh, model in, from the 70s and early 80s by Kuni uh, Fukushima called the Neuroconitron, and he was really inspired by classic work in neuroscience by uh, Google and Weasel, so classical is Nobel Prize winning about the architecture of the visual cortex. So the idea of simple cells and complex cells are kind of analogous to those sort of convolutional uh, uh, units, if you want, and the, the pooling is sort of like the complex cells. Uh, in fact, there are several computational models of visual cortex that are very much like the first two stages of a convolutional net. So um, when you apply this to, uh, when you train a system like, the, like this using backprop uh, to recognize uh, characters, you get something like this, so this is a representation of the internal state of that uh, convolutional net, where uh, on the left you see the input, and then you see the various layers uh, going from left to right. And as you go up the layers, the resolution uh, diminishes because the pooling and subsampling layers basically reduce the uh, spatial resolution of the representation. And then the number of feature maps is increased to compensate for that, and the result is that you get a representation of the input that is somewhat abstract, but somewhat um, robust to uh, uh, changes in position of the, the features and the, the, uh, the you know, characteristics of the, of, of the image. 
And so by the time you get to the, the, the top layer, so the, what is represented here is not the very top layer, it's like you know, the layer just before, uh, you basically get a, a global representation of the image in forms of kind of a list of features. And they're designed in such a way that this thing can recognize uh, characters. In fact, what's interesting about convolutions is that you can apply, the, you can apply them to uh, images of any size, right? And just get a bigger result if you apply it to an image of a larger size. And that applies to convolutional nets. So one cool thing about convolutional nets is that they're extensible. You train them for a window of a particular size, then you can just make the input larger and just apply the convolutions to larger fields. And what you get is something like this, where uh, uh, instead of a convolutional net looking at a single character, it looks at uh, a, a, you know, sort of sliding windows, if you want, over the input. But all of this is done with convolution. It's very cheap. And this is what convinced us very early on in the early 90s that we could use this kind of technique not just for recognition, but for simultaneous segmentation and recognition. What you see here is an example of uh, such a system. So it's fed with uh, an image that has two or three characters. And for every input window, the system produces a score. And what you see are kind of the winning categories, if you want. And then that, this is fed to a very simple uh, Markov model. It's not even trained, it's sort of handcrafted. Uh, a little white, weighted fine state machine, if you want, that pulls out the correct interpretation out of it. So this is very much you know, speech recognition -y a little bit. Um, but it's something that is, a, is even more uh, uh, speech recognition -y. Uh, something we, we, uh, we started working on in the early uh, 90s, around 1992, uh, uh, that we ended up uh, uh, calling graph transformer networks. And this took a lot of inspiration from uh, work in speech recognition at the time that was trained to kind of combine neural nets with hidden Markov models and train the entire system discriminatively at the, at the sequence level. So I uh, hired in my lab uh, Leon Motu, Yosha Benjo, and later Patrick Hafner, all three of whom had done a PhD thesis on discriminative training uh, at, at the sequence level for speech recognition systems that use neural nets as acoustic models. And I thought this was the key for handwriting recognition. So I had them at Bell Labs, and we worked together on trying to solve the handwriting recognition problem using those techniques. And, what, and they came up, the, the sort of general idea we came up with is that in the end, you want a system that uh, combines, uh, you know, can use heuristic segmentation, can figure out which is the best segmentation for a particular image, kind of like, you know, in sp continuous speech recognition, you don't, you don't know where the boundary between the words are, so you need some sort of graph search to figure out what, what the best segmentation is, simultaneously with the recognition. So it was kind of the same idea, except applied to images, it could have been applied to, uh, to uh, speech as well. And the idea was that the, the, the uh, data structure that the network, the neural net, would manipulate would actually be uh, graphs with values on them, which could be pieces of images, scores, categories, whatever, but essentially the essential object would be a graph instead of a tensor. So a lot of the neural nets are seen classically as being kind of tensor manipulation uh, uh, machines where each of the operators take a tensor as input and produce a tensor as, as an output or a multidimensional array, if you don't want to call it a tensor. Um, here we figured that we could generalize this to graphs with values on them. And so a graph would represent uh, an interpretation, for example, of, a, of, a, of an input or uh, a set of possible paths for segmentation uh, similar to, to a uh, speech engine. And the trick would be to make each of the module differentiable. It turns out you can backpropagate when you're through a Viterbi uh, algorithm to a shortest path algorithm. Everybody who's worked on discriminative training for, uh, for speech recognition knows that. Um, but we kind of started uh, uh, implementing this in the early 90s, and the, the, this, the first paper on this was actually published at ICAST in 1997. Um, we later wrote uh, a longer review paper that was published in 1998 in the proceedings of the IEEE, which is very well decided. But the idea was actually published at ICAST first. Um, and, and so that resulted in a, a check recognition system, which was this sort of stack of uh, differentiable modules, semi-differentiable modules, some of which contain uh, convolutional nets, some of which were just uh, you know, graph compositions, if you want to have a language model, for example, uh, something like this. And this whole thing was trained end-to-end -end, um, with uh, unnormalized uh, scores. So this was not manipulating probability, this was uh, manipulating unnormalized scores. This is a bit like what later became uh, conditional random fields, really. Um, and uh, this system uh, was deployed to read checks around 1995. 
uh, and by the end of the 1990s was reading uh, between 10 and 20 percent of all the checks in the U.S. We don't know the exact estimate, but um, the exact number, but it's somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of all the checks in the U.S. So it was very well identified. And this is just about the same time that two catastrophic events happened. The first one is uh, the very day where we were celebrating the deployment of the system, uh, AT&T announced that it was breaking itself up. Um, and in fact, the, the team that was working on this, the product team went with NCR, which was at the time a subsidiary of AT&T. The engineering team that was working, you know, building all the software and all the systems for this, uh, went with Lucent Technologies and the research team that it became the, the, the head of actually stayed at AT&T. And so the, the whole project was basically disbanded uh, the, the more or less the very day of, uh, of its uh, success. Simultaneously, a, a slightly more catastrophic event occurred um, it's not, you know, it's not one day, um, but over the years, which is that the machine learning community lost interest in neural nets. They kind of, uh, you know, I think sociologists of science will have to explain this uh, in the future. Um, I was too close to it to really kind of figure it out. But uh, the people moved away from using neural nets, and there was this legend, this myth, that neural nets didn't work for some reason. Um, I think there is a lot of reasons for this, which I'm not going to go into. But an indication of this is that you know, not, not everybody was convinced, even within Bell Labs, even within our own little department uh, at Bell Labs. Here is a picture of uh, Leo Betou, Vladimir Vapnik, and uh, Larry Jackal. Larry Jackal was the head of the, of the group at the time. Leo Betou was a member of it, as I was, and so was Vladimir Vapnik. And they had a bet in 1995. Uh, Jackal bets one fancy dinner that by March 14, 2000, people will understand quantitatively why big neural nets working with large databases are not so bad. And Vatnik bets one fancy dinner that Jackal is wrong. But if Vatnik fills out the bounds and conditions, then Vatnik still wins. Okay, so this was a thinly veiled uh, incitement from uh, Larry Jackal to convince Vatnik he should work on the theory of neural nets. It was a complete failure. Um, and no one still has a good theory for, like, as accurate as for models like support vector machines as to why neural nets work so well, why they don't want to fit that much, for example. There was a second part to the bet. Batnik bets one fancy dinner that by March 14, 2005, no one in his right mind will use neural nets that are essentially like those used in 1995. Jekyll bets one fancy dinner that Batnik is wrong. So Jekyll lost the first bet, but Batnik lost the second bet. And so there was no dinner in 2000, but there was a dinner in 2005, and uh, where both uh, Leon and, and, and I were invited. And uh, because they each lost part of the bet, they split the bill, and Leon and I just enjoyed the dinner. <laughs> um, so for a while after the mid-90s, since there was no interest for the community, and I was the, the new department head, and I was kind of interested in various things, I started working with Leon, as a matter of fact, on image compression and kind of stopped working on neural nets really in machine learning for about five, six years. And it's only uh, in the early 2000s that I resumed uh, working on, uh, on machine learning, uh, I'm not sure what the colors are wrong, um, and had a, a seed a project with DARPA to demonstrate the possibility of using conventional nets and machine learning basically to drive robots. And so this is a, a little truck robot, like a radio controlled uh, truck robot. So this project is from 2003. Uh, uh, in collaboration with a company called Netscale Technologies uh, that had former colleagues from Bell Labs. And we basically used imitation learning. So you have uh, someone drive this little uh, robot by remote control for, you know, collect about two hours of data, and you train a uh, neural net with about 20 minutes of, of that data to emulate the human driver by figuring out, you know, what uh, steering angle should I associate to this particular image. So you get two images in for the two cameras, and out comes the steering angle. And it works surprisingly well. So uh, DARPA said, OK, uh, let's start a bigger project in this whole idea with six teams, et cetera. Let's build a special robot for it that will share between the teams. That was called the Lager project, learning of micro robots. And our, part, our um, uh, team at NYU uh, and SQL Technologies uh, developed uh, software based on uh, commercial net to essentially label every pixel in an image as to whether it's traversable or not. So something like this, where you get uh, the neural net gets an image and you swipe the commercial net over the entire image, and the, the, the commercial net sees relatively large patches of the image, and it's supposed to label every pixel, the central pixel in that patch, as to whether it's something that the robot can drive over or whether it's uh, it's an obstacle. 
And the cool thing about this is that we can collect data using stereo vision. So you can run the robot around uh, and use the, the stereo uh, reconstruction from the multiple cameras of that uh, robot to figure out if something actually sticks out of the ground. And so that gives you training data without manual labeling of what is traversable or not. And then you use that to, to train the neural net. But the problem with stereo is that stereo only works up to about 10 meters. Beyond 10 meters, it's really inaccurate. So that's what you use the neural net for. And what happened there is that um, the system eventually um, uh, worked quite well. Um, and you, know, you, you, you run the neural net at about one frame per second. It's completely autonomous. And you uh, fill this in a map centered on the robot, and then do navigation in that map. Uh, to kind of reach uh, a particular goal, uh, and, the, and it, it was kind of one of the first examples of using, or probably the first example of using conventional nets for what's called semantic segmentation. So essentially, labeling every pixel in an image with the category of the object it belongs to. In this case, traversable, non-traversable, or you know, we actually had the third category, which was like the, the, the foot of an obstacle, the transition between non-traversable and traversable. Uh, so this is the robot running, trying to find its way to a goal far away with a couple of grad students who are trying to annoy him. Um, but they're entitled to do this because they actually wrote the code. They trained it, uh, which is why they're pretty confident the robot is not going to break their legs. Um, in fact, uh, one of those students uh, was, uh, so this was circa 2008. Uh, Raya Hatzel is one of the students. She's uh, head of uh, robotics research at DeepMind, and uh, Pierre Samanen, the other student, is uh, at Google Brain, also doing uh, research on robotics. Um, okay, so a couple of years later, we, we figured we could use this to do semantic segmentation, and a few data sets started appearing where you, you had you know, images that were fully labeled, that every pixel was labeled with a, with a category, so we figured we could train a, a functional net on this. Um, and, um, this is an example of uh, a result here. Uh, this is downtown, you know, on the NYU campus in uh, Washington, uh, near Washington Square Park in, in Manhattan. And it's far from perfect. It's been trained with 33 categories, uh, things like road, cars, pedestrians, uh, buildings, trees, sky, etc., sidewalk. Uh, and by the time it gets to uh, uh, Washington Square Park here with the trees, it labels part of the street as desert or sand, and this is the middle of Manhattan, there is no desert I'm aware of, but, um, so, you know, it's not perfect, uh, this kind of technique has made a lot of progress in the last few years, um, and we were able to actually implement this, uh, the, this neural net on an FPGA and run this system at about 20 frames per second, uh, and the performance was better than all com com uh, competing approaches using kind of more classical computer vision technique. We submitted this paper to CDPR, quite sure it was going to be accepted, and it was rejected soundly. Uh, basically, the reviews were, we can't believe it works because we're, we've never heard of this conventional net stuff. Like, you know, what is it? Um, this was 2011. Three years later, you cannot get a paper accepted at CDPR unless you use conventional nets. <laughs> Which is kind of crazy, too. Um, so, those things kind of gave ideas to a few people who were already working on autonomous driving, like uh, Mobileye, for example, and, and later NVIDIA. And they started using conventional nets for, for self-driving. So if you're, if you're lucky enough to have a 2015 model of uh, Tesla Model S, uh, it uses the Mobileye conventional net chip to, to do uh, autonomous driving. Since then, uh, uh, Tesla has developed its own system, also based on conventional nets, and NVIDIA has embarked on this. So, um, so that's... Um, uh, what's been happening over the last few years, but really what made this happen is the fact that around 2012, uh, uh, there was kind of a, a bit of a revolution in computer vision when uh, Jeff Hinton and his group, uh, Les Kujewski and the SS Caver, won the ImageNet competition. So ImageNet was a big data set, 1.3 million training samples, 1,000 categories uh, for object recognition. And the error rate were, you know, around 25, 26% with uh, sort of uh, more classical uh, vision techniques. And that year, uh, Jeff Hinton's team uh, went down to, brought that down to about 15%. And then over the uh, following years, the error rate went down to 3%, which is basically below uh, human uh, error rate uh, by sort of architectural refinements of various kinds. 
What was uh, the determining factor here is the fact that uh, Jeff's team was the first to have a very efficient implementation of commercial nets on GPU, and were able to train a very large commercial net very fast on this large data set and basically uh, you know, beat uh, everybody else. Um, uh, it took us a few months additional for us to have our GPU implementation. But then what's happened over the, year is that, over the years is that we've seen an inflation of the number of layers in those commercial nets. So the latest version of those commercial nets that work really well on ImageNet and other tasks has something like 50 layers or 100 layers, some, some even 150 layers. Um, so there's a particular architecture called ResNet uh, proposed by uh, Kai Minghe, who at the time was at Microsoft Research Asia, who's not Facebook. And the idea there is to have skipping connections so that if one pair of layers dies for, for a reason or another, the, the signal st still goes through. And so the, what the neural net computes basically is the uh, deviation from the identity, which is kind of weird. Uh, but it, it, it really made a huge difference in, in the performance of the systems. Um, so, you know, what makes commercial nets um, uh, so successful, in my opinion, is that the, they reflect the fact that the world is compositional. Um, you know, objects are made of parts, parts are made of subparts, subparts are made of motifs, visual motifs, motifs are made of essentially combinations of edges, things like that, right? So there's a hierarchy, a compositional, compositional hierarchy of parts that assemble and the multi-layer architecture of commercial net basically reflects this and sort of detects the, the suspicious combinations of features more or less uh, automatically. Um, so to tell you, to give you an idea of what the state of the art is, in this uh, uh, business here, here is Mascar CNN. This is a, a system uh, produced over the last two years by uh, people at Facebook in uh, Menlo Park, uh, Kamihi, uh, 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 and, and, and uh, his collaborators. And it is an example of what Mascar CNN can do. Uh, not only just recognize objects, but also draw the mask, the outline of the object. So it's a combination, if you will, of uh, object detection and recognition, but also semantic segmentation or even instance segmentation, in the sense that here each individual person is uh, is, is, is separate, is separated. Uh, here's another example. Uh, I think the current systems can uh, detect about 200 different categories, and it's pretty pretty amazing, uh, amazing how it works. And it's you know essentially conceptually simple. It's it's a big commercial net essentially, you know, trained in a particular way, uh, where the output actually produces masks. Um, and here's another example. This is a, a more recent project at Facebook Air Research in Paris by uh, 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 Yasuna Skoukinos and his team. And uh, this, in real time, on a single GPU, can uh, essentially track the pose of human bodies, multiple human bodies, uh, in, a, in an image uh, using commercial nets, you know, sort of like a little bit like a mask or CNN with sort of other, other tricks attached to them. So you can, you know, redress. Um, so, by the way, um, uh, the uh, system I was just like telling you about for, for object recognition and, and detection, uh, Mascar CNN is open source. Uh, there is an uh, open source code called Detectron, and it has a lot of the vision systems developed at, at Facebook uh, for, for, for that. Um, now, here is something that's slightly more surprising, and, or at least, you know, it's not going to be surprising for many of you here who have heard talks by uh, a number of people from uh, IBM, Google, and, 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 and uh, Facebook, and others, on, and Microsoft, of course, on using commercial nets for speech recognition. So commercial nets are, of course, not, not particularly specialized for images. They are specialized for signals that come to you in the form of an array, where the statistics are more or less unit variant, and there are strong local correlations. But other than that, you can use this for just about anything else. And this is an example of using commercial nets for translation. So you view the the sentence to be tra uh, translated as a sequence of vectors, essentially, because you can map <laughs> words into vectors. And then you train a particular kind of commercial net, called gated commercial net, to uh, produce uh, a sentence in a different language. And it uses tricks that are familiar to people in, in, in this community in speech recognition, of sort of aligning uh, sequences and, and searching for kind of the best, uh, uh, best sequence. I'm not going to go into details, but this works really well. This is also open source. Fairsec, and you can find it uh, uh, at this GitHub, the Facebook Research GitHub. Uh, there's a whole bunch of open source systems. Probably the most uh, relevant one is someone called, something called PyTorch, which 
which is the sort of deep learning framework that we use at Facebook uh, for a lot of our, a lot of our research. Um, so there's lots of application of the contents that, that people have been working on, that people have deployed, and there's probably these new ones every day, um, uh, particularly in medical imaging. So the user consciousness in medical imaging is a very hot topic at the moment. Uh, autonomous of the driving, obviously. Here's an example, another example. This is from our friends at NVIDIA. So these are the people with whom we collaborated on the Lager project. Uh, and their company was bought by NVIDIA, and now they're working one of the autonomous driving lab for NVIDIA. This is a system that's trained by imitation learning, very similar to the little truck robot that I was telling you about earlier, uh, where the, the conventional net basically predicts what the trajectory of the car should be uh, for the next uh, you know, second or, or two. And you know, this attempt could you know, drive itself in uh, rural New Jersey for, for about 10 miles without you know, crashing. Um, OK, so. Um, um, in terms of the generalization of neural nets, there is something called differential programming, which is the idea that instead of having a fixed architecture for the neural net, you define the architecture of the neural net by a program. And when the program is run, it keeps a track, it keeps track of all the operations that are being done, and then it can unroll the tape to compute the gradient. And the graph doesn't have to be the same for every time you, you, you run uh, the, the, the system. So that general idea of sort of dynamic graph uh, neural net is called differential differentiable programming, uh, and I think it's a very powerful idea which may completely transform the way we write software in the next in the next decade or so. Uh, so people have been playing with uh, funny kind of dynamic architectures, uh, things where you have a neural net that's augmented by memory, if you want, uh, uh, which is another kind of neural net. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but it's basically a RAM circuit with soft gains in such a way you can backpropagate right into it, and you can have uh, essentially a neural net decide whether to access this memory to look for uh, you know, particular data of, of, of various kinds. This called, so memory augmented network and it's been used a lot in neural, uh, natural language processing for various tasks. Uh, I'm not going into the detail, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. Something I just want to mention, and I believe there is a paper uh, at, at this conference by I think some of the co-authors are Michael Bernstein and uh, Xavier Bresson on a generalization of conventional net for signals that do not come to you in the form of a multidimensional array, they come to you in the form of a function on the graph. So if you have um, a signal that is represented by a function on the graph, and you'd like to apply a conventional net to it, there's a way to do this. There's, in fact, half a dozen different ways to do it. Um, and uh, some of it is based on uh, uh, kind of spectral uh, graph theory. So you can define conventions on irregular graphs as uh, uh, essentially diagonal operators in the eigenspace of the graph Laplacian, if that means anything to you. And, but there are other techniques that uh, Michael Bernstein and Zeri Boisson have, have developed and, and others uh, that are very interesting. So this is just kind of a, a you know, just an ad. Uh, they, uh, together we actually wrote a, a review paper on this. Um, um, of course, I'm sure you've heard a lot about uh, deep reinforcement learning. Um, and it works really great for games and virtual environments. So a particular example of this is you want to train a machine to play Doom or to play Atari games or to play Go. Uh, you can have the machine play millions of games against uh, itself and kind of you know, fine tune its, its policy. And so reinforcement learning is a situation where you don't tell the machine the correct answer, the, 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 the correct action to take, but you only give it a, a, um, a reward or punishment depending on whether the outcome is good or bad. So this is the way uh, AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero has been trained. It plays millions of games against itself, and it kind of reinforces the, the strategy employed when it, when it wins against itself, uh, and sort of de-emphasizes the others. And basically what you get in the end is kind of a, a sort of compiled uh, knowledge of which move for every particular position will lead to a, a winning uh, a game, essentially. Um, so this works really well. Uh, when, you, when you have uh, virtual environments. So this is uh, an example here of, uh, by our colleagues at DeepMind uh, that tried you know, lots of different techniques on uh, uh, training a machine to play Atari games. And 100% performance here corresponds to human level uh, performance. And so you see the systems being able to go beyond human performance. But if you look at the x-axis, the number of trials the systems have to do uh, to actually get to decent performance is enormous. It's, uh, the best system takes about 80 hours, 83 hours uh, to get to human performance. 
uh, of equivalent real time. Of course, you can run the games faster. Uh, and uh, most methods uh, without those, all those tricks, you know, take about 230 hours uh, to play. But human performance, most people can get, can get to it in, you know, a few minutes. So there is a, an issue here, which is that it requires many, many interactions. And so obviously we're missing something here. You know, we are, as humans, we're able to learn how to drive a car without having to run off cliffs 50,000 times, right? In fact, we hardly ever run off cliffs. Okay, and we can launch a car car in about 15 hours of practice. We can, you can launch a fly an airplane in about 20 hours of practice. Um, you know, without actually, without major incidents. And so how, how do we do it? You know, obviously we're missing something with our machines uh, that we are able to do. And so we can't really use reinforcement learning in the real world because, uh, you know, any action we take can kill you. And also you can't run the real world faster in real time. So there's a lot of people who try to train self-driving cars by, you know, training them in, in simulators and then try to kind of transfer the behavior to, to, to something else. But we're releasing something to get to real AI, right, human level, or even, let's say, cat level, or dog level AI. Um, you know, today with current technology, we can have separate cars, we can have better medical image analysis, personalized medicine, you know, decent language translation, stupid chatbots, but possibly useful. Uh, search, certainly better search, information retrieval, etc., and filtering. But we cannot have machines that have common sense. We can't have intelligent personalized systems that are not incredibly frustrating to talk to. We can't have household robots. That if your brain tries to predict what the world is going to look like when you move your head, the notion of depth will naturally emerge as a representation of the world because that's the simplest explanation for how the world changes when you move your head. Um, Object permanence, here is this little baby orangutan here at the bottom. So it's being played a magic trick where this guy puts the fruit in the cup and then shakes the cup and then shows the cup and the fruit is gone. And the baby orangutan is extremely surprised and rolls on the floor laughing. Uh, these guys are almost as smart as humans, uh, which is interesting because they don't have language, they are not social animals, they don't they barely interact with each other. Uh, yet they are very smart and they have a very good model of the world. You can build tools and stuff. Um, so, there are three types of learning. There's two types of learning that we know uh, how to handle, reinforcement learning and supervised learning, and they are inefficient because they require a lot of data that is manually labeled. And then there is the third form of learning, that's called itself supervised predictive learning, where you just learn by observation, you learn about the structure of the world by observation. The necessity of this, so that led me to this slightly obnoxious uh, uh, machine learning beam now, which, uh, you know, if you count the amount of information that the environment gives to the machine in those different modes of training, in reinforcement training mode, you're just giving it a, a reward once in a while, so the amount of information is tiny, it's like a cherry on a cake. Uh, supervised learning, you, you tell it the correct answer, the correct answer usually is a small number of bits, it's a category, uh, so it's like the icing on the cake, the intelligence is a cake. And then the bulk of the cake, the genoise, if you want, is uh, is this self-supervised learning because there you basically have to predict everything from everything else. And so that you know, provides the machine with a lot more information. So there's really two big questions on the way to real AI. How can machines learn as efficiently as human and animals? Probably by observation without supervision, with very little interaction with the world. Um, and how can we train machines to plan and act, not just perceive? Um, and I think the, this idea of predictive learning is kind of the answer to both of those problems. Uh, whatever the next revolution of AI is, it's not going to be supervised, no, nor purely reinforced. I, I stole the idea from this slide from Alyosha Air Force, one more thing. Um, so, um, let's skip ahead a little bit. So, what if we want to learn predictive models in the world? Um, in fact, this idea of having a predictive model is a very classical thing in optimal control. You, you're supposed to have some predictive uh, model that gives you the state of uh, the thing you're trying to control at time t as a function of say that time t minus one and an action that you uh, or command you descend it. And from that you can plan, you can unroll a sequence of actions and see what the result is, and then you can by gradient descent and back prop or whatever, you can actually figure out a sequence of action that will minimize or optimize a particular uh, criterion. That's classical optimal control. So why can we use this in the context of uh, having a predictive model that is trained by, by observation? And this is something that you know, various people uh, like Rich Sutton and, and uh, etc. have been advocating for a long time. So if you want to build 
a real AI system, it's going to have to have, to have an internal predictive model of the world if, it, if you want it to be able to plan in advance and, and learn with a relatively small amount of, uh, of trials and, and data. Um, so this world simulator is, is the thing we need to, uh, to train. How do we train uh, predictive models of the world? There is a small experiment that some of my uh, colleagues at Facebook have done a few years ago of uh, putting a stack of cubes and then uh, letting it fall or not, and then training the commercial net to predict what the end state is going to be. And what you see is that, particularly on the, on the, the, the bottom examples, those predictions tend to be a little fuzzy because the system cannot really exactly predict what's going to happen in the future, so it predicts kind of the average of all the possible futures, and you get those fuzzy predictions. That's the idea of using just purely supervised learning to predict what's going to happen in the future. You get those fuzzy predictions. And so, in, in, in real life, the, the world is not really predictable. You, uh, you know, if I put a pen on the table here, I let it go, you can't really predict in which direction it's going to fall. And so, I don't want to punish the predictor for uh, telling me the wrong answer. I only want to punish it if it predicts something crazy, like the, you know, the pen is going to fly off or something. So, here is an example of a predictor uh, that can predict multiple outputs. It's basically a function that looks at the context, perhaps uh, a few frames of video. It also has access to a source of random vectors. And it uh, makes a prediction, and depending on the random vector uh, drawing, it make, it's going to make a different prediction, which hopefully I'm going to rely on this red ribbon, which represents the, the, let's call it the data manifold, the set of uh, uh, outcomes or outputs that are plausible, if you want. And what you'd like is you'd like to uh, punish the machine if it makes a prediction outside of that manifold, but not if it is on the manifold, regardless of whether the current uh, uh, instantiation of the experiment uh, produces. So, um, what we need is a way to train uh, basically a contrast function, let's call it an energy function, that tells us you're on this manifold or you're outside the manifold. Right? So let's say our universe has two dimensions, it's composed of uh, those samples, so those dots here are samples that we observe. And obviously those samples indicate there is a dependency between Y1 and Y2. What we'd like to learn is some contrast function that tells us you are on this manifold of data or you're outside. You know, and this is sort of a depiction of this energy function being trained uh, so as to learn to give low energy to data points on the manifold and higher energy to other points. So, um, you have the elements for what's called adversarial training, which was originally proposed by Ian Goodfellow, Yoshio Benjo, and uh, Aaron Proville at the uh, University of uh, Montreal. Um, but this is a particular formulation of it in terms of those energy functions, where you'd like to train, a, for example, a video predictor. So you look at the past, a few frames, and you ask the machine to predict what the world is going to look like half a second from now or a few frames from now. And you let it uh, make a prediction. The prediction is going to be bad, and you're going to assume it's bad. And you're going to use it as a contrast to your sample to run this energy function that tells you whether you are on the data manifold or not. So you have basically two neural net. The first neural net is a predictor, the second neural net is called a discriminator. And that discriminator is this energy function. It's got one scalar output. It's trained to produce a low output, a low value on its output for real things that actually occur in the world. And it's, it's trained to produce higher outputs for things that are produced by the generator. Okay, simultaneously the generator trains itself to produce outputs that the discriminator can't tell are fake. And it can cheat because it knows the gradient of the output of the discriminator with respect to its input, and so it can adapt uh, its, its uh, parameters so as to bring the, the green points closer to the data manifold. And if you're lucky, and if you use all kinds of tricks, uh, this thing will converge to a situation where the generator produces things that look nice and the discriminator really can't tell the difference between what is fake and what's real. Um, there were really stunning demonstrations of this going back a few years, and this has made incredible progress over the last few years. This is an example of artificially generated faces at high resolution by a group at NVIDIA. Um, this is a upcoming paper at iClear uh, uh, next month. And those are, uh, this is a generator that's trained on celebrity. There is no X, it's just a bunch of random sample, random vectors, and I a a picture of a celebrity, and those are fake celebrities, they don't exist. Um, so it's, it's pretty stunning, there is a number of work along those directions. At Berkeley there is a demo, something called Pix to Pix, you, you draw a very simple outline and it turns it into a photograph basically, or, or a portrait. 
Um, let me skip ahead. This is uh, interesting work at Facebook. Um, but I want to talk about uh, video prediction. We've got video prediction with adversarial training. So if you use traditional supervised learning, you get those uh, uh, horrible blurry predictions as you see on the top. But if you use adversarial training and a few tricks, you get those kind of decent predictions here. So here, here the first four frames for each segment is observed and the last two are predicted. And you know, the predictions are decent. Here's another example where here a camera, uh, uh, I mean the system has been trained with uh, images of, uh, or videos of uh, uh, apartments in New York and the system has to invent what the apartment looks like when the camera rotates so it figures out this uh, bookcase is going to continue as being a bookcase, that the couch is going to extend as a couch, etc. So it's you know, captured some, some uh, uh, dependency there. Uh, we can do a slightly better job uh, by predicting not in pixel space, but in the space of semantic segmentation. So we run a semantic segmentation system. This is work done at Facebook Air Research in Paris uh, by uh, Pauline Luc, Natalia Neberova, uh, Kevin Coupri, and myself. And uh, there you, you, you train the system to predict where those masks of objects are going to move. And you can predict up to you know, uh, a couple seconds or so that uh, when a car starts turning left, it's going to keep turning left, when pedestrians start crossing the street, the street. That's a good thing if you want to plan uh, for training. So more work on a similar uh, thing, which I'm not going to go into the details of. It's not using adversarial training, it's using another technique uh, called error encoding network. It's a, uh, an archive paper uh, by uh, some of my students and I. And, uh, and there what we can do is uh, also uh, generate predictions of what, uh, what can happen in video. Let me show you a better example here. And what's more is that we can, we can use this to control. So this is a system here that's trained to predict the trajectories of a spaceship that can be subject to thrust and everything. And uh, it, uh, uh, it, it's playing a game where it's supposed to kind of meet one of the space stations around this uh, planet that has gravity. And, uh, and it's trained, it can train itself to do this with considerably fewer samples than kind of traditional reinforcement learning. Uh, but quite, uh, Okay, I'm actually going to stop here and take questions, and thank you for your attention. Right, so uh, if you want to ask a question, come to the microphone. I think there's a couple of microphones here. While you're doing that, can I, can I do a quick announcement? I just want to remind you that Jan will be also again with us. based on reasoning, right? And we talked about physical reasoning, social reasoning, and so on. Uh, so what's your thought on how you can infuse this into this, this sort of a GAN-based kind of predictive model you have? Right, so they, I think there is several types of reasoning. Um, one, one type, which I briefly mentioned, which is basically what's going on in the, this last demo I showed, is uh, you have a predictive model of the world, and you use it to reason, which means plan ahead a sequence of actions that will result in a particular outcome. So you could think of this as a form of reasoning. In fact, I think you can reduce every type of reasoning that people have thought about. You can reduce them to somehow minimizing some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, uh, objective function, right? Uh, so for example, probabilistic inference uh, in graphical models, in probabilistic graphical models, you know, tends to find the value of variables that maximize the likelihood or minimize the negative log likelihood. That's a minimization. Uh, sometimes minimization of free energy, something a little complicated, but it's always a minimization. So I think every form of reasoning is some form of uh, minimization. Now, if you have a complex uh, machine learning system where part of the system consists in actually minimizing a function, like computing the value of a variable consists in minimizing a function, that means that you now have a piece that can perform reasoning inside of your learning machine. So I think that's one of the big challenges of the next few years is how you uh, merge uh, differentiable operations, if you want, uh, deep learning 
with uh, architectures that are capable of resilience. That's a big challenge for the next few years. There's a lot of attempts which I skipped over today, uh, which I think are very interesting in those respect. Uh, uh, so memory augmented networks are one example. Uh, there's, there are other examples that uh, people are on, which I, I find very exciting. It was a great pleasure of listening to you, Professor Likhan. Uh, my question to you is, uh, you mentioned like how babies learn very quickly. So is there any research on perhaps like our brain could be pre-optimized, like some priors are hard-coded into the brain to enable that quick uh, learning? Is there any research on this? Well, so there's a big question. You know, it's the, uh, the big debate between uh, nature and nurture, right? The innate versus the acquired. Uh, I actually had a public debate with uh, Gary Marcus, who's a psychologist, uh, a few months ago at NYU. The video is available on precisely that question, how much prior structure it would be required to reach human level uh, intelligence. So we don't know how much prior structure we have in our brain. We know that the, the cortex is pretty much the same everywhere. We can, uh, there's experiments with ferrets, we can connect the optical nerve on the auditory cortex and it becomes a visual cortex, basically. Um, so, there seems to be a lot of flexibility in the brain that uh, you know, relatively little, little uh, pre-specification of what uh, each part of the brain does. Uh, but there's of course a huge amount of structure in the brain, so how much of it is necessary for intelligence to emerge is a big question. Thank you. Thank you, Nina Karan from Arizona State University. Thank you for the nice presentation. I have a question about the effect of visual quality on the performance of deep Network, especially we have sensing, uh, you know, we have also distortion due to acquisition, uh, you know, sensing, and more and more people are using their cell phones, and we have consumer grade data and video on YouTube, on Facebook, you know. So, if you have any noise and blur, what we discovered is when human can still see, so if you insert noise, human, no problem, the DNN performance goes significantly, like from 90, about 90 to 30 percent. So, people, if they add some noise now on their photos, maybe feel good, they can be tagged. So what's your opinion on this? And, you know, I mean, clearly the human perception, uh, the performance of human perception is much more robust to uh, noise and other perturbation than, than, than those systems. You can train the system to be robust, so there's a lot of work, uh, you know, at Google and various other places on robust speech recognition, far field speech recognition, of course, for you know, physical assistance and things like this. Uh, Tara Sainat has, has been working on this quite a lot, and I think she probably gave talks here about this uh, before. Um, uh, and, and so, I mean, clearly we, we don't match the performance of human perception. It's the same for images. Uh, face recognition systems, for example, are amazingly accurate. We can deal with a very, very large number of, uh, of people to recognize. Uh, the main issue is that, you know, if, uh, if, if the view is uh, profile or low resolution or the hat that's a little too big, you know, it, it starts degrading really quickly. So, uh, we haven't reached uh, human performance in that respect. Uh, not clear how we get there. Now, to give you an idea of the scale, uh, uh, there's 2.2 billion users on Facebook. They upload on the order of 2 billion photos on Facebook per day. Every single one of those photos goes through essentially four commercial nets at the moment. One that is used to do uh, uh, essentially objectionable content filtering. One that's used to do face recognition. That's not turned on in Europe yet. Uh, one that's uh, used to do, uh, to basically decide what to show you in your news feed, so whether the image is likely to interest you or not. Uh, and one that uh, produces captions for the, uh, for the uh, visually impaired. And all of this happens within two seconds of the photo being uploaded. So you can imagine the scale of computation. We're spending a huge amount of cycles and energy running commercial nets. If there's any hardware engineer here uh, who like, is interested in figuring out how to design more efficient architectures for this, uh, we are all ears. There is all kinds of companies working on this already. Facebook is actually hiring hardware engineers to work on this problem at the moment. So many of you are interested. We are working in our lab on this problem also, so to regenerate the features. So we tried to find features that got corrupted in the network. We found that all, not all features get corrupted. The noise is concentrated. We tried to re regenerate those or correct them. So how to find? Yeah. So yeah, it's not clear. I mean, yeah. what's, what's clear is that you know those systems deal with things to be trained on. So if you train them without noise, they're not going to deal with noise. You train them with noise, and then they deal, they deal with the noise. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the overwhelming presentation. Very, 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 very rich. Thank you. Indeed.
Um, my question is, have you considered the role of uh, the recent discovery um, about the mirror neurons by Professor Ricciolati and uh, colleagues in Milan? Mirror, Sorry, which, which mirror, 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 mirror neurons, neurons yes. which are present in all the mammalians yes. and uh, are the indication of uh, empathy and the uh, uh, engine to learn quick and uh, probably also the, uh, the mean to, uh, to learn to speech. To right, speak. right. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So it's not entirely clear whether there is a pre hardwired structure that uh, causes this mirror neurons to, to, to pop up in the brain or whether it's the result of learning by imitation. So there is a natural uh, drive for, for, for human babies to learn by imitation. It's true also of birds. Some birds learn by imitation as well. And there's quite a bit of work in the machine learning community on imitation learning, which is sort of somewhere in between reinforcement learning and supervised learning. So basically you observe a behavior uh, of, of someone else or another entity and we try to figure out what is the objective function that they are optimizing when they are uh, taking this course of action. Right. And if, um, if my, my, my hunch is that if you build a machine to do this kind of stuff, and people have done it, you will see the equivalent of mirror neurons popping up in those, uh, those machines. If I can add, uh, indeed, in this phenomenon, there is a prediction. Yes. The, there is a, a famous experiment, a human and, uh, and a monkey, Right. The monkey predicts what the human is doing or some fraction of uh, yeah. uh, section I had. Oh, absolutely. I, mean, I had that on the slide. Your prediction is the essence of intelligence, in my opinion. So, yeah, absolutely. There's all kinds of predictions. Our, our brains are prediction machines. Okay. That's, what, that's what we should make our machines do as well. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. When humans learn things, they keep adding new things or new classes dynamically. How do you think a deep learning model can replicate the same thing? So yeah, when human learn things, they yes. keep adding new, the new classes dynamically. How can a deep learning model replicate the same thing? So like adding new skills, new categories, new categories, new categories. So that's very easy actually. So that's called transfer learning. That's actually used in practice all all around. So including at Facebook. So for example, there's a service within Facebook where a large conventional net has been trained to classify all kinds of different categories. But then you might have a product group within Facebook who wants to train a, a classifier to recognize, I don't know, uh, you know, Louis Vuitton bags or something. And so they only have a few samples. And what they do is that they take the feature vectors computed by this generic commercial net and they train a classifier on top of it, just a couple layers. And for that, you only need a few samples. And you can add categories like this. The face recognition system also doesn't know in advance how many categories it's going to have to deal with. And so basically you have a generic on that, that that produces good features for any face, and then you have essentially a, a, a classifier dedicated to every single person that needs to be uh, classified. My question was, suppose there is a con having 10 classes, and I want to add two more classes to it, and I don't have the data for those 10, previous 10 classes. Well, so yeah, I mean the question is, is it going to be able to run without perturbing the previous classes? Yeah. If the number of previous classes is very large, you can assume perhaps that the features cover the space well enough that you don't need to retrain the entire network, in which case there is no perturbation of the previous result. Um, but if the, if the pre-training was done on just a few categories, then you will have to fine tune the entire network for it to work, and there, you don't know what happens. Right, so. I'm going to keep going until Rico stops me, so. Hello, this is Vincent Lostornel from Cornell. My question to you relates uh, to your concept of compositionality. Uh, you motivate the success of convolutional neural networks by the claim that natural data is compositional, and there are grounds to believe so, otherwise convolutional neural networks would work nearly as well. However, the issue I take with compositionality is that it is not, as far as I can tell, amenable to a numerical test of any kind. On the other hand, all the other signal processing arguments in favor of uh, convnet, state locality of correlation, stationarity of statistics, invariance to deformation, sparsity, fractal dimension, and so on, are to some extent testable. Mm -hmm. My question to you is how to confirm or how to falsify the assumption of compositionality in a data set, thus predicting the adequacy of confidence architecture for the task at hand. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know, actually. I mean, perhaps uh, one way to test compositionality is that if you have, if you train a model that assumes compositionality and it works, 
maybe that's one element of confirmation that composition might be actually the thing. I don't even know how to define it quantitatively, it's very difficult. But it's something that people working on natural language uh, understanding are very interested in. So a lot of, uh, there's been experiments that show the failures of things like recurrent neural nets in STM or even combat to actually capture the full uh, composition of uh, nature of, of language. Uh, they don't generalize, you know, you, you train that with sort of multiple uh, structure, you know, sentence structures with particular words, and they don't generalize to the fact you can have the same sentence structure with other words. And so, uh, uh, for something that we know for a fact is compositional, those models actually don't quite work yet, right? That's that's a big challenge also in the next few years. Okay.